Aurora Kadaku Kakadu National Park Resort. Y tenemos al turista. Tres camitas como siempre, por si nos peleamos. Siempre tan detallistas. El techo es curiosillo. El baño grandote. Y las vistas estupendas. Ay, mira, te lo pone aquí. Chicos, chicos. Estaba bien preocupado porque no lo encontraba. Piscina. A Gideon's Beagle is provided. Y la, y la fauna, que se nos ha escapado en la carretera varias veces la foto, pero aquí podremos hacerlas tranquilamente, guanabis. Vamos a ir en un barquito que es muy, 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 pero que muy parecido a uno que sale en una película que se llama Super Croc, creo. Que van en un barquito como este en Australia, un río muy parecido a este y conduce una mujer y que se, qued, se quedan no sé si con gas, no, de repente notan un golpe debajo del casco se quedan en un islote que subirá la marea y hay un cocodrilo de 14 metros que se los jala habrá que buscar explosivos porque la película lo matan con explosivos me parece me acuerdo. si nos bajamos y vemos la película otra vez no El que va a sobrevivir, no. O sea, pues te lo hagamos a él. Este que va en el golpete. Y, y falta una buena. Mierda, soy el extra que no tengo. Que muere en, la pre, en, la, en el primer ataque. ¿Qué pasa? Oh, en la nueva generación 2, después de 8 meses, los plantas y los animales, se esperan pacientemente por esos primeros drops de la lluvia que viene a venir. And when they do, these creeks and billbongs and rock holes, they get flushed out. So all that stagnant water, it rushes down here. And it actually causes a natural fish cull. So a lot of the larger fish die. And that's why you can fish here all year round. And then what happens as the rock holes and that's... These white birds out to the right, oh, these white birds out to the right, um, they're intermediate egrets and also the one in the, the second tree from the, le the left hand side. Quite a common bird out here. And then if we take a look at this tree that's in front of us in the water here, Just as we go past, on the lowest branch, you'll see, it looks like just a clump of debris, but it is actually a little bar-breasted bee in his nest. And it's made out of strips of paper bark and, and spider webs. People at the front of the boat should be able to see it clearly now. Just on the left hand side. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Incredible. I mean, you'd never, you didn't know you wouldn't sort of think. You'd probably just think the water's been really high and left a whole lot of debris there. But 
that's home to the little bit here. Just... Yep. Um, it does get shallower in, in places, but yeah, this is all water. Right through, right to South Alligator. Some of this grass does die off and then um, you'll just see really muddy areas. It's when a lot more of the birds come here. At the moment there's a little bit too much water. You can't sort of walk around and gather, I mean, find food. Because and just buffaloes would wallow in the water and stir up the tannin, and some people say that that's why this is called yellow waters. There's a, there's a lot of theories, and they're all quite boring, so I don't tend to, to mention them. Um, the Aboriginal clan that, that um, owns this land, they're called the Murumbu people, they call this place Narichaba. And that's that 16 letter word that you might have seen on the signs as you came through Quinta. It's a bit of a hard word to pronounce. Even after two years of being here, it's still quite difficult. But why am I taking you over here? Because I'm just going to show you that that's our car park during the dry season. Oh. Can you see over on the right hand side all the signs yeah. and the poles? So if anyone comes here during the dry season, you'll probably drive around here and say, Oh, I was there in the wet season when it was all covered in water. We actually drive in there when it gets a little bit higher. It's a bit too shallow to go in there now. We're not good for the props. But that's our car park. And actually something else that I think is quite interesting, this pontoon over on the left, as we're going past, if you have a look at those green poles, or those olive coloured poles, halfway up you can see where it's been yeah. welded. You see that welding line? During the floods of 2007, these pontoons actually lifted off those poles because they were, they were only as tall as that first welding line. So they lifted off and started to float down our channel. And then after that happened, they, they put that addition onto it to make sure that it doesn't happen again. If we got that much water, we'd be in serious trouble. about Kakadu, it is Australia's largest national park and it's just under 20,000 square kilometres and this probably sounds funny but that makes it half the size of, half the size of Estonia because Estonia is 42,000 square kilometres or a third of the size of Tasmania. Um, there are 10 Aboriginal, there were 10 Indigenous clan groups that live here um, these days they all speak the same language uh, with their second language being English. Half of Kakadu is owned by Bing people and the other half is under land claim. And in 1976 and 1971 um, the Northern Territory Government introduced the Northern Territory Land Rights Act and ever since then Aboriginal people have been reclaiming their land. The Aboriginal people that live here, the Bidding people, they live pretty much as close to their traditional ways as possible. So they still hunt and gather and fish and perform ceremony. Uh, they have evolved in terms of they do like live in houses and drive cars and wear clothes and go to the supermarket. But they, they pretty much live the same way apart from that. And um, it's important that they can, you know, do these things, you know, hunt and gather and perform ceremony because then they can pass on their culture and their tradition to future generations. Did they go to school? Uh, yes, yes. Um, yeah, they, 
they do have to go to school now. I mean, yeah. out of the communities, um, depending on the size of the community, there's, there's, there's schools. Um, places like Catherine and oh, most places around, if um, the parents are on um, welfare payments on Centrelink, if their children don't turn up to school, they don't get their Centrelink payment. So there's all that type of you know incentive to to send your kids to school. But a lot of them, a lot of them do. If you go to Darwin, there's a lot of Aboriginal children in their schools. Yeah. Um, yeah, they they, they do those. But there's some that don't. Um, I mean, there could be. There's, I mean, they they always went to school. It just wasn't called school. Um, you know, in terms of their education, which was different to ours, so we thought they hadn't been educated. Um, but during the wet season, obviously the people of this, the clan of this group couldn't stay here because there was too much water. So what they do is they go to the stone country, they walk to the stone country, and that's where you see the rock art sites. And that's where they teach their children about law and language and behaviour and about flora and fauna and um, you know how to look after the country. And it's a really good point because, you know, when Australia was, was colonised, it was colonised because it was claimed as terra nullis. And that means land belonging to nobody. Which was not quite true because the land did belong to our Indigenous people. It's just the date in 1848. Yeah, um, it's really interesting. There's this book that's just been a oh, while. Well, it was published in 2008. Something really small book, and it's just got extracts of Ludwig Leichhardt's uh, journal. And he had really strong relationships with, um, you know, different Aboriginal clans. And it's suggested that that's why he perished and everybody else perished because he formed these really close relationships. He understood their culture. And he was passing on that information to, you know, the people in Europe and, you know, England. But they didn't want people to know that there was, of course, you know, tens of thousands of Aboriginal people here. Because, as I mentioned before, they claim this land terra nullis, land belonging to nobody. So the theory is that his people sent him a, a bag of poison flour. And so when he was cooking up the, the cake or the, the damper, and they were all sitting around eating it, it just slowly killed them. Because no one went looking for him for three, until three years later. But um, <laughs> this particular couple have tried to retrace his step and he steps, and in fact, um, they, they're looking at putting a bushwalk together. Um, and that will be retracing some of Ludwig Leichhardt's track, a bit, a bit like uh, the Larry Pinter Trail and the Jet Buller Trail in, um, in Catherine. But here, we're at three ways here. Um, if we continue over to that right-hand side, we'd be continuing upstream in the South Alligator. But we're going to head over to the left-hand side, and this is where the riverbanks have burst. And this is the floodplains out here. Favorite out here, just these wide open spaces, and just beautiful. Now, there's little birds with little chicks, and I can see them. And you, you see that little bird with little red. If you have a look around it, there's little tiny chicks about two centimeters off the ground. I can see them. But you don't know what they look like. Can you see the little chicks? One's just in front, one's... They're on their own now, and they're hard to see. They're called comb crested jacanas. You can't see them now. The dad will go back. That would be male, because he looks after the chicks. Yeah, I can... If you see where he is, about 20 centimetres in oh, front, I you can see, see a little yeah. chick. Yeah. <laughs> Mm. Actually, we talked about uh, males being, uh, females being bigger than males with the white-bellied sea eagle. Same goes with the comb-crested jacana. In fact, during um, 
breeding season, the female has up to five partners. And the male incubates the eggs, looks after the chicks, the woman just goes out and keeps the species going. <laughs> um, they've got really large toes. Their toes are nearly the length of their body. And that gives that that gives them the well, gives them the ability to be able to walk on walk on lilies. Although there's a lot of salvinia out there. That's the ferny colour thing, that's the introduced weed compared to compared to the native plants here. Um, but they used to be called, called Jesus bird. Um, Qué calor. Ya te una mosca, eh. Mira qué bonito. That's a great bird, Heron. Beautiful big bird. No lo pillo nunca este. Mira qué grande. Yo he pillado uno de estos, no sé cuál es. No sé si este otro más pequeño. I mean, you see them here, but just back in home, Billabong. Actually, just over to the left, you can see that clump of dirt in that, that tree there. That's a termite mound. That's an arboreal termite mound. And you might be able to see the... It's not so easy on that tree, but there are termite tracks. That's made by termites. And we have the forest king fisher that lives up here. Se montaron las termitas, se montaron ahí el nido. Pero, um, people, they think of termites, they think of pests. Because they, they decompose and they generally decompose organic matter like wood, leaves, grass. Um, up here, they're critical to the, the, to the ecology, to the environment, to habitats. Um, we have a lot of nutrient poor soil, not so much here in the wetlands, but in the drier country. And termites being decomposers, they they put nutrients into their whistle ducks that just flew past. They put nutrients back into nutrient poor soil. They make nutrient rich soil. They also put little holes in the ground and they aerate. That helps the ground to aerate. They're called macropores. And also when those first rains come along. It helps the ground absorb, scientists say, around 30% more water. The other thing they do, they're a good food source for indigenous people, very high in protein. During, if you're a termite, you're either a, a king or a queen, a soldier or a, war, a worker, or you're reproductive. And at the beginning of the wet season, the reproductives grow wings. They fly out of the termite mound, hoping to meet up with a you know, termite of the opposite sex. Um, what typically happens though, for those that don't get away, they're either eaten by goannas or lizards or birds or indigenous people uh, know when it's going to happen so they catch them and yeah, they eat them. So they're quite amazing, these little termites that really go unnoticed, they're like, they do so much work. Um, you know, everyone comes up here to see crocodiles and that's, you know, that's great, but they 
crocodiles are just consumers. All they do is eat. They don't mm -hmm. really give back. But these little termites, you know, they they just, you know, keep giving back to the, to the environment. The other thing, they, I mean, they provide a home for different animals. They provide food for different animals, and they put. Just see the home build on the sign there, just on the left. Just about to go underwater.